Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, so just by way of introduction, I'm an economist and I run the graduate programs in sustainability at Bard College in New York. Um, and uh, so we offer MS degree programs in environmental policy and climate science and policy, an MBD in environmental education and an MBA program in sustainability that's based out in Manhattan. Um, and what I wanna talk with you all today is about some work we've done over the past, mobilizing climate educators worldwide um, and uh, work we hope to do um, in the coming year. Um, and um, so this is the plan. So uh, with some funding from the Open Society University Network, uh, we've got a small crew and we're hoping to promote a worldwide teach-in on climate injustice scheduled for March 30th, 2022. Um, and uh, just to give you a flavor for the worldwideness of it, um, this is uh, something that uh, some of our interns put together um, to sort of give you a sense of, of what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, ideally, we're gonna engage a thousand colleges, universities and high schools, half a million participants. Um, a year from now. Um, and of course, that's with your help. So uh, this is all about really tapping into, uh, you know, probably the tens of thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands of climate concerned educators around the world. Um, and really just giving them a platform to, um, to focus in um, on cross campus engagement around these issues on that day. Um, so I want to talk about three components um, and uh, hopefully have lots of time for a conversation. Um, the first is uh, a model that we are going to promote for people to actually do this successfully and easily um, of one night climate teach-ins um, uh, and then combine that with work we've been doing this year on uh, global university hosted uh, webinars on regional climate solutions and then a social media campaign to Hashtag make climate a class. So the, let me talk about the teach-in first because um, what we found in our past work um, is that um, in order to get people to join a, a big collaborative climate education initiative, you've got to provide them with something that number one is perceived to be effective. So that if I, I do it, it's actually gonna matter, right? For my institution. Um, it's got to be uh, exciting and sort of fun to be part of. Um, and it's also got to be pretty easy because, uh, you know, nobody has any bandwidth these days. People are very busy. Um, and so um, we hope that the model that we're presenting of this one night climate teach-in is, is perceived as effective, um, exciting, and easy. Um, so uh, on the effective side, what we've discovered is that if you're really trying to engage a broad campus conversation about climate change, um, then you really want to engage um, lots of faculty. Um, so that broad faculty engagement um, in any climate event is sort of foundational to ensuring that you get beyond the usual suspects. Um, the folks who are gonna show up for a climate oriented lecture, for example. Um, and so we developed oh, over 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, a model for a, a one night teach in that um, basically involves 24 faculty members from across the institution. And that's really quite easy to organize. So we did this at Bard a year ago, actually just before the pandemic. The, on the right is sort of blown up what you see on the poster there. But it's, it's really just an evening of concurrent panels. So we had um, uh, six, three, com three concurrent panels over two hours. So six panels total, uh, four speakers in each one. So, you know, we had roughly 30 speakers, 28, 30 speakers um, over the evening um, and a couple of dozen faculty members. Um, so if you get a sense of what these panels are like, um, you know, the first one was on climate injustice. So we had an, econ an economics professor talking about guaranteed jobs in the Green New Deal, global inequality. We had a politics faculty member. We had a student talking about climate dividends. We had somebody from an NGO talking about investing in our communities. 
And then we had a session on, you know, is it too late? We had three scientists and a philosopher, um, one about the story wars that kind of reached out to the humanities folks. So I had a philosophy and religion professor, a filmmaker, also a physicist and an anthropologist, um, one on climate solutions that was economists, policy people, um, cities and climate that got over to our history and architecture faculty. Um, we brought in a town supervisor and then dealing with climate depression. So we had an artist, psychologists, um, sociologists, literature. So this is the kind of interdisciplinary dialogue that really is super easy to organize. Essentially, you know, if we gave you, if we gave most faculty members this list of topics and asked them to, you know, think for a couple of hours with a few colleagues, they could identify the, the 24 faculty members that they'd want to invite, send them some emails, pretty much done. And when you've got that structure, you're sort of guaranteed to have a couple of hundred students involved. Because you've got 24 faculty members, they're gonna you know, require their students to come, give them extra credit. And it just creates the kind of buzz that you know, deans love, right? You know, this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue just doesn't happen very much on campus, um, but climate change is just a real powerful foundation for this. Don't have to be experts because you're not talking about climate change science. You're really talking about an issue related to climate change from your disciplinary perspective. Um, so you're really tapping into those climate concerned faculty members who aren't climate experts, but who welcome the opportunity to be part of a teach-in, bring their disciplinary uh, perspective to bear. Um, so this is the model that we're gonna try and get a thousand colleges, universities and high schools to embrace. Um, and, uh, and then you can sort of tack on in the beginning or the end, whatever you would like. You know, you could have sustainability office presenting information throughout the day. I think this one started out with a band, a marching band. Um, and you're gonna have then some sort of concluding or keynote opportunity. What we had here was a panel with, you know, top university administrators at the end um, and some students and others, but uh, it can end in, in a number of ways. So this model is really at the core of what we're gonna try and promote globally um, over the next year. So before I go on to the other two, let me just pause and just see if any, any questions about, about this as a vision or a model. And I'll get into the organizing part in a few minutes as well. Yeah, I have a sure. question. I think James does too. Yeah, go ahead, Deb. Um, so I have a quick, and sorry for being delayed. I was actually logged in as clean on a different link somehow. Um, so sorry about missing the top end of the meeting, folks. Um, so I have a question about the work I have attended, actually, some of the initial work that you guys were doing last year, and have a question about these teach-ins being focused on learning climate science or learning about how to teach climate science, um, and those things being, you know, interwoven but different. So what's the question? So it, which is the goal? Um, the webinars that we've been in the last couple of years have really been policy focused, and I'll talk more about them. So it's really been an effort to uh, generate conversation about climate solutions. A um, little bit of climate science, but mostly about what are, you know, big, ambitious, feasible things that could happen, you know, in your region in the next couple of years that could really move the needle on, on solving climate by 2030, which is the, the tagline for that initiative. So... Um, you know, the presumption is that kind of at the university level, most students have sort of a, a vague enough understanding of climate change, global warming as a phenomenon, um, that the conversation can move to solutions. Although we have, you know, you can certainly throw in a, a science panel or two here um, to address some of, the, some of those issues, depending upon how big your, your science staff is. Uh, just please ask questions. Yeah. So, so, um, so Jim Callahan, um, obviously I'm going to be asking questions going back. We've been working together since Focus the Nation times. Yep. Yep. And it's with an eye towards what our organization does, what others we work with who can contribute to. You always put on important programs, really important programs. So it's a little bit to understand what's similar, what's different. You just spoke to some of them. Um, do I, so I understand it's going to be college and university level and high school level and then in the faculty and so on. That's the target audience, not going younger. 
Um, well, it could, the, uh, it could, and I okay. could really use your help with that part because we don't really have a good solution there. So um, we've got a good solution for university. I'm not sure we have a good solution for high school because I'm not sure how well this model works at the high school level. Yeah, and and I, I, I mean, I would no definitely if if whenever I'm speaking of anything that's science or STEM directed or engineering and so on, it's going to have the action. Thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be taking action and so on. Yeah. So there'd be a little bit of, you know, what what uh, academic subjects are you looking to have physics professors? Are you looking to have a, 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 you know, engineering people? Um, uh, there's also the one of, of uh, one thing that's very powerful. I know when we first started working out at UC University of California, Berkeley, students would just sign up all day long to want to volunteer out in the community. To, to to take action and then what do the engineering students do what do the science students do to to take climate in a way that people do that so I mean kind of okay so I'm, yeah, I'm kind of getting it's kind of being formed up a lot and it's a little bit to see who comes in but but you're not there's not a lot of doors closed here right it's not hey we're not interested in <laughs> physics <laughs> you know? no no absolutely not now, we have a physicist or two in here I think in the mix um, as well so yeah this is really an open-ended format and you know we'll probably have on our website 40 different panels that you could assemble um and if you you know got uh, a lot of science faculty or a lot of humanities faculty or a lot of architecture faculty you can sort of bring them in to bear um and you know in terms of you know what next and what are the action steps that's really decentralized and, and that that happens on different campuses different universities all around the world we're not going to be able to drive that. We're just creating a, a forum for how do you get a lot of people together on one night to um, to talk about um, about about climate um, and about climate science and climate solutions. Yeah, please go ahead. Just just dive in. Uh, even uh, thank you for the, this opportunity and your 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 long commitment to this work. So uh, I'm really happy that you're able to join us, and I'll, I want to remind you. Um, that, that while the people who are here today, um, we have a large, since this is recorded, lots yeah. of people can't make one o'clock Eastern. Um, mm -hmm. So just remember that you're, you're speaking to uh, the unknown as well okay. as the known. Um, so thank you. Uh, the question, I, I mean, I, I know this is a, a international, but in the United States, as you know, the higher, if, if higher education is the vector for this conversation, um, there are a lot of higher education institutions in this country. Um, and, you know, is, is there a, can you describe any kind of dynamics about them? I just found this college map uh, tool that uh, Department of Education has. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of institutions out there. But can you, is there anything that says what an ideal, because, you know, not everybody has the faculty that could pull this off. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the, the kind of the ideal criteria that you would be present in order for an institution to be able to do this work well? Yeah, you know, so some of you have been with us since Focus Nation and working with us since 2008 or 2006 on this stuff. So yeah. um, that was Focus Nation. This is Focus the World, right? That's really yeah. what we're going to do this time around. We're not using that terminology exactly. Um, and there really isn't, you know, we basically want to have, have as huge a tent as possible with this. Um, and so we're gonna create sort of a core structure that we think works for most colleges and universities. You know, I think this would be fine for most community colleges. You could do some version of this um, all the way up to, you know, R1 research universities. Um, so really what it requires is not so much anything structural about the, the, the institutions, it just requires two or three faculty members and or students that want to step up and do it. Um, because as with any teach-in, anybody can do a teach-in, right? I mean, it doesn't have to follow the structure. It could, it could have some other dimension. It could be, you know, bring in speakers from the community, however want, you people want to organize it. So we just really want to sort of get the message out there that we've got, you know, a decade or so to ambitiously reduce emissions if we're going to hold climate to the low end. And as educators, we need to have at least an annual focus on this and, and, and a global and annual focus. And one of the things I'll talk about in a minute is that we've been so encouraged by the global engagement that we've had with um, the Solve Climate Initiative this year. You know, in fact, it's been super successful in Colombia, right. and Indonesia, and Malaysia. 
Um, because what's happened is that you do have those faculty members there and those staff members there who are looking for that opportunity to come together and create something big. So it's, that's the energy that we're playing off. And in our sense is it doesn't really matter what type of institution you can have a huge success at a community college or, or, or an R1 university, it doesn't really matter. And I, I don't know how well this will work in high schools. And so, and I know it won't work in K you know, through eight, but we want to encourage those institutions to do something and we need to get a model for that over the summer because we don't have it yet. So, so maybe I'll, I'll go on or, or maybe there's one more let question. Me, let me just tease, tease yeah. out a little bit yeah. more. It's not necessarily the institutions, it's the, the faculty that like, like the, I've watched climate reality, you know, yeah. follow up things go south really fast because yeah. the person didn't know the science enough and question and answer fell apart really fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so I'd imagine there is some, and it's not about just climate science, but there needs to be some expertise in this at some level. I, yeah. I think, you know, like the, the faculty is actually what more what I'm focused on than the institution. Yeah. That's a good question and not one I've thought a lot about. Um, okay. But it's, it's worth keeping in mind. And I think that because the focus, well, part of it is that we do wanna create sort of a, a, a also a teach in a, in a box um, and that's the global webinars. So, so let me get to that piece, but there's one more hand up there. So that's, uh, let's see who that is. Yeah, um, thank you very much. This is a really exciting project. And I wanna first build a little bit on what Frank was saying that um, in preparing for it, just some pointers as to ways, possible failure points and ways to deal with them. For example, mm -hmm. several colleges could come together or invite in faculty that have the expertise mm -hmm. that their college may not have, raising some of the questions Frank raised. Similarly, I'd like to encourage in the general structure, even though the follow through and action will be specific to each place. There are some general guidelines for how to do that, that you could build into your general structure. And if there were a website or resources that people who want to at least follow through on their own, maybe mm -hmm. organized around the topics you've raised. Yeah. Because the, the problem I see again and again is that all this information is laid out and people feel overwhelmed and you can tell them not to or you get them excited about acting, but they, th that next step isn't there. And some uh, campuses won't have done that. So giving it a structure as a follow through. Yeah. Great suggestions. Um, and one, oh, and I'm sorry, one last yeah, point. I don't know how much the subtitles underneath each topic are given, but I'm looking at the don't mourn organize. Yeah. And suggesting, um, Mourn yet, mourn yes, but organize or then organize. Yeah. Because there's a pretty widespread sense that grieving and mourning are kind of an ongoing as grief is. It comes and it goes, and it needs to not to be shut down, but to go beyond. And so, language of some sort that suggests that it feels really, really important. Thanks. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. And, and, and the idea is that these are completely fungible, right? No one is ever tied to any of these titles. The idea is we're going to give them as a template and people are free to move them around, change them so they fit better, the speakers. That's just a reference to Mother Jones. That, that's a Mother Jones quote we may know of um, from the labor movement. But, yes. um, but I yes. get your point. I get your point. Yes. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about what we're doing did this year um, to kind of lay the foundation for the work next year. Um, and sort of two pieces, one is the global dialogue webinars that we right now in the midst of sponsoring. Um, and the, the other piece is this hashtag make climate a class campaign. Um, and it'll address some of the issues in terms of website and resources and, and opportunities to move forward. So um, I'm gonna drop out of this and just go to the website here. So. So this is what we did last year and this year um, is uh, uh, because we've been, you know, cooped up uh, under COVID, um, we, uh, we, we've actually been sponsored. Last year, we sponsored uh, webinars in almost all 50 states that were university hosted. 
Um, and this year um, we've expanded to, we got 48 US states plus, including DC and Puerto Rico as states um, being aspirational. And um, uh, about 64, I believe, uh, international sites. Um, and these are ongoing. So it's very exciting right now as we speak. Got a nice interactive map here that shows all of these locations. You can see them. Um, so we could click on this little dot here and it'll pull up Rio Negro, Universidad Rio Nacional de Rio Negro in Argentina. And you can click on that little guy and it'll pull up the program that's happening down there. Um, so I can't read Spanish, but there's something happening there. Something happened there last Wednesday, um, some kind of event on climate change. Um, and, uh, but you, you know, in general, you can just, you can get a, a sense of just the, the real sort of outpouring of engagement that we got. I mean, there were just two of us and really one and one and a quarter cause I'm only working on this a quarter time but David Blockstein was the guy who was the man behind the curtain and, and then, you know, a bunch of graduate students and some folks helping out, but um, just, you know, really sort of incredible engagement. And um, I can just give you, do I have them up here? Oh yeah, if I go back to the slideshow, um, just some, you know, kind of quotes of what, what was going on this week. Uh, this is Universidad de los Andes. Yesterday we had our webinar with six professors from Uniandes, this is in Colombia, to talk about climate classes across different departments. 455 persons have seen the webinar so far on our YouTube channels. Next week, we'll have a second webinar to talk with students about climate action, how they've been inspired to take action. In Kyrgyzstan, we had 200 registered and 100 showed up. Amazingly, after two hours, we'd lost only 20 people. We tried to wrap up, but the participants wanted to keep on going. So we went for two hours and 20 minutes. Universitas Indonesia, people logged on starting 30 minutes early and watched amazing videos, including Be Courageous. By the time I logged off as a second speaker was starting their national lead on climate change, there were 652 people on the Zoom call and 51 on their YouTube channel. Uh, Universidad del Norte, Colombia, we had 1,048 subscribers and 720 views of the YouTube video. Kansas State, we had over 50 participants uh, and our event had excellent content. Um, they also got on the TV news as the folks did in South Dakota. So they reached a lot more people than were showing up for the webinar. Um, so. So it was really sort of surprisingly successful for, for David and I. We just didn't really anticipate this level of international interest and engagement. Um, and it really kind of gave us some confidence to be able to kind of put a, a, a marker in the sand and think that as we go back to in-person that we'll really be able to tap into a lot of global energy. Um, and, uh, and, and we think there'll be pretty good uptake of, of this in-person climate change um, vision. Um, they were all recorded and we're, uh, co we're collecting them on a YouTube channel. So we're creating this archive library of expertise. So, you know, eventually we've mobilized, you know, something like 350 climate experts and youth activists and others around the world speaking. This is from last year, but you can see this was uh, Alabama and Alaska and Berlin and Brazil and California. So we're in the process of assembling the 2021 videos. They're not all complete yet. And so that webinar uh, library will be there. And, and this is kind of the, the teach in in a box, if you will, right? The, I mean, the default would be you can show your regional webinar and a conversation about climate solutions in Uruguay or Liberia or Kyrgyzstan or India um, as your kind of centerpiece for your teach in and then have a conversation about it afterwards, right? So you wouldn't even have to assemble all of those faculty members. You could really just show your webinar and then have a dialogue about it um, as a very, very easy way to hold a teach-in. Um, and, and even if you had the one night teach-in, you could show the webinar in advance or you could have that as your keynote, you know, after everybody's had their conversations, everybody could go into a big auditorium, show the recorded webinar, have a conversation. So this is really the, the kind of the glue that's going to hold all these pieces together. Um, and we're going to try and increase the number from 100 this year to 200 next year of these university hosted, hosted webinars that um, focus again on, you know, what are three big ambitious things that could happen in 
place X over the next year that could really move the needle on, on climate. Um, so, so that's the global webinar dimension uh, of the project. Um, and again, it's just what we're tapping into is just this deep climate concern on the part of faculty, staff, and students. I mean, the typical organizing team here is, is a faculty member and, you know, somebody from their sustainability group, um, a couple of graduate students, an undergraduate in some cases, the one in Washington State's being organized solely by, grad, by undergrads. Um, but, but really, it's mostly not students. It's mostly faculty and, and uh, mostly not undergrads. It's mostly faculty and grad students that are, are doing the, the lifting. So, Frank, maybe that, that addresses some of your, you know, you know, if you don't have grad students, it becomes, you know, it's really going to be on the faculty shoulders to do this. Um, and, um, and then the final piece um, is, uh, is this is this thing that we call um, uh, uh, make climate a class. Um, so this year, because we didn't have the in-person teach in, um, we were trying to figure out a way, how do we get people to actually watch this content that we've created? Like, you know, we have about 10,000 people probably will watch it live over the last week and this week globally. Um, but, you know, that's not nearly enough. So how do we get everybody to watch these webinars? Um, and so we, we've been testing sort of a social media campaign around this hashtag make climate a class. And the basic sort of theory of change, I guess, is that there are climate concerned students out there who are doing all kinds of stuff around climate change. And we're gonna challenge them to do something very simple, which is to ask their teachers to make climate a class, a one hour discussion. Um, and we mean in every subject, art, English, math, physics, chemistry, engineering, business, uh, religion, any class, right? And, and, and all their teachers. So imagine every climate concerned student asking every teacher every semester to make climate a class and we're gonna make it easy for them, right? So here's the resources that we created around that. Um, so we have a one page teacher's guide for philosophy and music and art and math and international affairs and language and earth sciences uh, for people that wanna use the webinars, their regional webinars as a launching point for a conversation. So suppose I'm a, again, a psychology professor um, uh, and the student comes and asks me to make climate a class, well, what do I do? I show my regional webinar, the recording, and then I have the students talk about it for you know 20 minutes about what they think about those solutions and have they heard about them. Um, and then it becomes a psychology class. So break the students into groups of three, which state of mind best characterizes most of your peers on climate change, A, avoidance, B, despair, C, determination, D, other, what are typical prescriptions for moving beyond states of avoidance or despair? Do you think these are applicable here? So you turn it into a psychology conversation for the last half an hour. Um, and you know, we, we just went through and did that for you know, all these subjects, very simple approaches. The art class, for example, you, know, you would go online and find images of climate solutions or climate science and ask whether those are effective images. Um, um, and, and we were able to translate them into Spanish and French. So we've got uh, those resources available. So this didn't work very well, just to be honest. We didn't get very many students asking their teachers to make climate a class, uh, given the resources we put behind it. Um, uh, but we're still kind of like it. Um, and we want to see if we, can, if we can make it work more effectively. Um, and in order to, to push this idea, uh, we had, some, again, we had some funding from uh, Open Society Foundation or Open Society University Network. Um, and um, so uh, we were able to do something interesting this spring, which was to host a massive open internship online, a MUI, uh, if you will. Um, uh, in social media for climate activism. So we just put out a call and said, who wants to be, you know, do a 10 week internship in social media for climate uh, activism? 
And we had like 400 students from around the world sign up for this. Um, and um, we actually did, we would do two two hour sessions, one on Monday from 11 to one and one on Monday from eight to 10. So the eight to 10 in the evening, Eastern time, that would enable the folks in Asia to participate. Um, and the 11 o'clock one got the folks in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty amazing. So we had probably 200 people show up the first day um, that kind of whittled down to about 140 and 140 stayed with us for five or six weeks. And then ultimately got down to about 110 or so that finished all 10 weeks of the internship. And so they would come and we'd have two hours of strategy and conversation about how to build online opportunities, experiences. Um, and then, um, uh, and then their, their, their job was to go out and work for three hours a week on their own. I had a fabulous instructor, 23 year old woman who just really knew what she was doing. You know, they formed teams. You know, we had, I think 26 different media channels, social media channels with like dedicated Western US, Bangladesh, Latin America, um, Russia, you know, channels in Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. Um, and, and it was just really cool to see them self-organize. You know, they're on Slack and they're creating this group and that sort of group. And, you know, a bunch of them stepped up into leadership roles and really powerful stuff. Um, and collectively, I mean, they just put out a lot of content. Um, and uh, we were asking them to be the people to drive the Make Climate a Class idea. Um, and they worked hard on it. And as I said, it, it wasn't quite as effective as we would like, but we think it's a powerful idea. And so we want to stick with it. I want to just show you quickly this video that was really an amazing video that was produced by the team um, that sort of highlights the idea behind this. So hopefully you can hear this okay. I can save our land against this Cut it right in the middle. Let me start at the beginning. Okay. It's not really that bad. Oh, yeah, it is. Climate change, it's pretty close to home for South Carolina. The, the UK's city of Charleston flooded one of the most raging wildfires in California. These winds died down. This fire is unstoppable. Page, ferocious fires scorched terrain as Earth Water heats. shortage is forcing more than 13 million people to have to boil their water before they can use it. Marcus Moore. It can take air out of my little brother's lungs. What if it submerges my Bangladeshi land of love, magic, stories, and songs? I'm afraid my hands can do nothing to stop the downpour. I'm afraid it will leave us alone in a world of concrete and plastic. Groom Gaia into a vacant void. It, it will take, take the, the green and leave, leave us in, in the, the dark. dark. I'm afraid it will bring out the worst in people. Uprooting our families and communities. Leaving our children to an irreversible nightmare. Taking the beauty of each season from us. Causing untold suffering that could have been prevented. I am afraid. I'm 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 afraid. What are we being taught? What are they teaching us? Economics, literature, math, engineering, history, music. What meaning do they hold if our climate swallows us whole? I can be courageous. I can, I can be courageous. I can use my voice and passion. Keep fighting even on the days it feels hopeless. I can fight for my people. I can hold on to the new game I still have. I can save our land against this world. I can be a voice for the sky, the soil, and the sea. I can make a good future for our next generation. I can stand up even when it feels easier to sit down. I can love my brothers and sisters after the lives. If you have the same mother, the great mother Earth. I can be louder than polluters that try to silence life. I can do my part and leave others around me to do better. I can ask my teacher to make climate a class. I can ask my teacher to make climate a class. Make climate a class. Make climate a class.
Okay. So that's kind of the vision behind that, and and we're gonna we're gonna stick with it and see if we can keep sort of promoting that as part of of the mix. Um, so um, yeah, just so just concluding, and then we can maybe have some discussion about this. Um, yeah, there we go. That's the plan. Um, uh, we did do this, and with your help, uh, 14 years ago, we had a couple thousand colleges, universities, and high schools around the U.S. doing this. So we. We think the time is right to focus the world. So um, what we're going to do, and this is where we really need your help, is the way we're going to do this is uh, Dave Blockstein and I um, are going to um, hold organizing meetings uh, probably the first Wednesday in every of every month um, starting in July. Um, and we'll have you know three or four calls spread over two or three days so we can catch all the time zones. Um, and it's just going to be an opportunity for us to put together a five minute slideshow, get people on board with the idea, and then tell them they don't have to do anything until January 15th. Um, uh, but we really want to build uh, awareness and engagement of this um, for the six months, you know, beginning early July and then carrying through um, through the fall. So you will receive um, uh, monthly kind of appeals from David and I. Uh, urging you to tell everybody you know that, that the one thing they have to do this month is jump on one of these calls and learn about this project. Um, so that's really our main ask is uh, just help us drive everybody you know to one of these conversations because our whole, our whole modus operandi is that this doesn't require much time, doesn't require much bandwidth. We're gonna give you a package. All you gotta do is put it into action. But collectively, obviously, if we all do that, then it's going to have a huge global impact. Um, and of course, some people will run with it. Some people will move beyond the basic and they'll do a whole day and it'll be awesome and amazing. But, um, you know, it's thousands of people getting, you know, thousands of people to, to talk about this that we really are envisioning. So glad to discuss or take questions. Uh, Nancy, I think you have one. Do you want to go ahead? And others, if you can use your digital hands, that'd be awesome. Thanks. Oh, I'm. Thank you. I forgot to take my hand down. I already had had my right. comment from before, but it's others? really exciting. Really exciting. I've been. Others and James and um, Jason, Emily. I don't know if you're on the phone and and uh, I'm not sure. So if you have something, let me know and just pop in. So I have something if nobody else will, you know I'll I'll, I'll do I have ten thousand questions about stuff like this. Well, Frank, are you not gonna trump me? Do you wanna ask? Go for it, Frank. Ask your question. No, no, you go first. <laughs> oh, this is awesome, even like really, really terrific work. And I've been tracking your your stuff for some time. Um, I'd love to know like how the like how the webinars, I guess, is how you're connecting the learning in the webinars that's going on to like action in the world work, I think is a little bit of the thing I don't quite have connected yet. Um, the webinars are policy focused, right? So, or at least we wanted them to be, that's what we asked. We, we asked all of the people to come up with their three ideas for what would really make, move the needle on climate change. And of course I watched the one in New York and it was nothing like that. <laughs> there were not three ideas advanced and there was great conversation and it was really interesting, but it did not follow that format. So first thing to recognize, we have to be very humble about our ability to get any result out of this platform. We're providing the platform, but people are gonna do with it what they want. Um, and our action item this year that we tried to push was, was make climate a class. Mm -hmm. That was the specific thing we put into kind of the intro video and, and made an appeal to students that were concerned about this. I, you know, I don't think it worked, um, but we're just trying to seed that idea. Mm -hmm. We also asked, so um, to each of the, we asked our moderators to ask each of the speakers to identify three big ideas, but also each identify something that citizens could do or students could do. So again, th that would be very, we're gonna have an interesting kind of summary event this Thursday um, where we're inviting a student from every university to come online 
and in 30 seconds say, you know, I'm Karen Suarez from University of uh, National University of Mexico, and you know, a green recovery in Mexico uh, means you know we protect our forests, and here's what people can do. Uh -huh. So one action, one policy idea, and one sort of citizen action from each part of the world. Uh -huh. So that'll be fun to see, but it it really that part is very decentralized and distributed. Uh -huh. You know. Um, uh, we'll probably offer up, we may go into co-sponsorship with Earth Day or uh -huh. uh, 350 or somebody and, you know, say, you know, that, that, that they're kind of more responsible for getting all these names and plugging them into organizations and motivating folks to uh -huh. have a, a platform to do other stuff. But we really see this as just a purely educational play, partially because we don't have the bandwidth to too many people involved for us to try and impose any kind of structure on out yeah for sure outcomes. um frank is it okay because we haven't heard from emily yet Can we that's emily? where i was going next yeah. emily okay hey, <laughs> you're um okay so um i i noticed in your video it was sort of fear-based storytelling um you know, let's be afraid of climate yep. um there's been a reframe from at least the academic set that I've been chatting with about how to focus on the agency piece. Um, we're using iterative goal setting and agency teaching agency as a story structure. Mm -hmm. um, again, I think I'm gonna bounce it to what, what Deb said about connecting to you know, tangible, doable, specific requests. Um, and I guess, I, I guess I'd like to talk with you maybe later about how we can reframe particularly the art pieces so that we don't end up with a bunch of really scary art, what we end up is agency teaching art. Uh, fabulous. I had nothing to do with the video. The students put that together, um, you know, and that's great. And you should mm -hmm. be worth looking at just kind of what sort of posts they created. I think they were mm -hmm. mostly focused. I mean, we had some conversation about that, that we really want this to be solutions focused. Um, but I thought that was an actually, many people have made that video and I thought that one actually worked very well because it was really authentic. It was coming from real fear and an expression of the way that students really are feeling. So I felt it was very genuine. It wasn't sort of exploitative in that way that it sometimes is. So I get your point. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, this was a preach them down and preach them up kind of video, um, which is, you know, sort of it's the Jeremiah basically structure of, of argument, which has its place, but I, I agree it can be overdone. Frank? Um, and I'd love to have the conversation. So let's make an appointment and um, I'd love to learn from you. Thank you. Even uh, building, building on that point, uh, I'll be super quick. Uh, uh, one of the things that we've unearthed in the number of years we've been looking at this, um, this work on how education relates to climate action is that one of the hidden stories is the amount of climate solution work that's already underway, but mm -hmm. is completely invisible. Um, and, and you have to really work hard to find it. It's happening, um, but, but that is the hidden story. Uh, and if we wanna normalize and build momentum off of what is to get to what needs to be, we have to start from where we are in the story. And it's not, we must begin climate action. Um, Continue. And, yeah. and, but, but we have, it's so hard to see it. It's invisible and we, and we have, part of our, our craft has to be what Emily's talking about, but also building off of what is, yeah. um, and not in a Pollyannish greenwashing way, but in a, in a real way. But, um, you know, this is the piece of the story. And I think there's, there's good work there that has yet to be fully optimized. That's good. Jim. Yeah, we'd love to have you guys come talk to our interns next year. With yeah, that'd be fun. This messaging stuff, it'd be great. That'd be super fun. There's a bunch of folks here who have like loads of, of sort of framing narrative kind of expertise. So um, Jim and then Eric and then Nancy. Great. Thanks, Deb. Stephen, um, then there's the question of translation and language. Mm -hmm. um, definitely seeing how, you know, and this is a matter of uh, different international work, um, work working together. Um, you know, in, in, in uh, the networks we work in on the international to the science festivals, uh, admittedly, we're taking kind of the soft, easy approach first. We, we're we're set. We've got uh, work with Sweden, 
uh, Ireland and the UK. So those are lang either first language English or very close second. I mean, Sweden people are very, mm -hmm. it's very bilingual, and the, and the science festival is set up or ready to be bilingual. There's the Swedish sessions and the English sessions and so on. How, how are we seeing that? Is that more to be translation, you know, that, that there's different channels in different languages? I mean, of course, there can be one session in English and some in others, but how, how are we thinking on on that and, and you know, the, the need for translators? Well, I mean, we're, our approach is essentially asking participants to do it in their own language. Um, so we've got, you know, regional webinars and that's part of the strength of this, right? Is that, you know, we've got folks in Hungary talking in Hungarian and folks in Indonesia talking in Indonesia so, so that it can really reach a broader audience. Um, and our challenge just is to translate as much of our centralized material as we can into a few different languages. I mean, the, most of our organizers speak English. Uh, in fact, they all do, people who are the university hosts. So, um, uh, but, but for next year, we're gonna have to have materials in at least, I mean, I think Spanish, Korean, uh, Indonesian, and uh, probably uh, Bangla because we got such great engagement from Bangladesh. Those are probably the four languages that we wanna hit. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe others. Um, um, Eric? I think the, the big uh, question that comes to my mind is how does your effort fit into the ecosystem of other things that are going on at this sort of scope and scale? So I was thinking about like the timing of the COP convenings and the Climate Reality Project or fall-based large-scale global kind of efforts. So you've got that kind of going on. And then you've got Earth Day that's going to come right after your event in March. Mm -hmm. So that's another chance to sort of globally connect. And then I was thinking about the strengths and the things about your project that really stand out to me. One of them is this idea of a toolkit and a sort of an in the box thing that universities can sort of cookie cutter mm -hmm. replicate. So I really liked that idea. And I think there's a tremendous amount of strength there. And in the way that Frank suggested that climate reality doesn't have the depth of the science understanding, the universities sit in a really special place because they're sort of, they can reach out to folks like climate reality leaders that are passionate and want to give presentations, mm -hmm. but there's so much more depth. You can mm -hmm. also reach out to those high schools and those K-12 audiences. If each university is its own hub for the community, UC Berkeley is like crazy big and complicated, but the smaller universities can be hubs in a similar way, but just maybe more local. So I'm thinking the depth that you provide, the depth proposition is huge the interdisciplinary vision of, of getting it out into all of these different uh, curriculum and, and, and disciplines is also, I think there's been so much conversation in our clean network about that and other dialogues I've been having with people. That's huge. And I think that, I really think that's a great one. And then the, the international depth that you're, you know, you're suggesting and, and sharing is also really inspiring. The idea that you're really reaching out to an international audience uh, and, and educators, you know, institutional university educators. So, so just really looking at the strengths and then how it fits into the, the global ecosystem of other things going on. I mean, I think the other piece is that, you know, if you think about a teach-in, what you don't want is, you know, droning on keynote speakers, right? <laughs> um, you know, and so one of the nice things about it is that we've structured as a conversation, right? Nobody talks for more than five minutes. Um, and that that I think uh, both enables lots of people to participate, um, but but also keeps it from getting boring. Um, and uh, but in terms of timing, you know, largely this was driven by the academic cycle. You know, when is a good time, at least in the northern hemisphere, schools that I'm familiar with to hold an event. Um, and um, I've always found that kind of early April is a good time, late March. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little, maybe it's a little too early. It's going to interfere with spring break, but my daughter's getting on April, married on April 2nd. So it's got to be over by April 2nd next year. Um, so that's sort of determining the timing a little bit. Um, but, but that end of March is actually, um, you know, people are back from spring break. The energy is there, the opportunity, at least in the U S but um, frankly, I need to check in with like, 350 and others to make sure there's not some other big global mobilization happening that week. Uh -huh. uh, and I haven't done that yet, but um, 
I think we would pretty much complement anything that was happening anyway. I, I don't think it's, it's unlikely it would be on a Wednesday, regardless of what else somebody else is doing. So that's another no, that's nice awesome. thing. You can go do it on a weekend. No, that's awesome. Thanks, Eric. Um, I liked your summary. I was just like, wow, that was awesome. Um, uh, last thought, Nancy, we're at time. So last thought? Just, yeah, just a, a quick thought tying together what Eric and the others were saying. You have if a question in the, the conversations you have each month has to do with how to surface solutions and the solutions are not only proofs of concept of what can be done, but different look strategies that can be looked at as well. You have a whole year to develop that knowledge base that could then be, and treat what you're doing as a recruitment for all these other efforts. That ecology that Eric is talking about an opportunity to surface it and recruit with the tools and the follow-up, that much of it at least built in. All right, I'm gonna thank you because I can see folks popping off as the like hour hits and, and people have other commitments. So I'll thank you very much, um, but hang on for a moment if you can. Okay. Um, and just um, thanks everyone. Sorry again for the technical difficulty in me logging in today. Um, so thanks, Katie, for, for all your support on that. Um, and if we can go ahead and stop recording and we'll say bye to everyone.